Thank you to Bossy. So, um, just uh, this is going to be out of order because we have some technical issues that uh, have cropped up. So, I can't use my own computer to present, which means that the photos will all be out of order. Three years ago, we spoke at Liberty Forum um, because we had moved ourselves and six other people from California, the Bay Area, to, um, to here. And we had done a Liberty Caravan. And so, it was kind of an exciting countrywide drive. Um, so we live just just outside of uh, San Francisco. Um, and will this just page through? Excellent. Um, and so we are not country bumpkins. We just kind of moved there. Um, so I worked at Apple Computer, as did my wife, um, and managed classrooms and decided at one point that it was time for us to move. And um, you know, we actually have our own segue, and we live in Grafton. It's kind of interesting that way. Um, I built my own data center in, in one of the closets at Apple and had my own 40 terabyte um, RAID array. Um, so yeah, kind of moved from a very technical uh, place to a very, very untechnical place. Um, and so we ended up um, finding what we actually looked in, um, in Manchester, in Nottingham, in Northwood. Um, and then we had, we, we had finally gotten a trip to go to Grafton and um, found that it's not actually that far away. Um, we always thought, oh, Grafton's just so far away. But it depends on where you're looking at. And I mean, if you're, if you're in Grafton, it's actually the most convenient place in the world. Um, and so we decided to look at Grafton and found that um, it has all the things that we wanted it to be able to do. Um, since I was 16 years old, I've wanted to build my own house. And um, I, my grandfather built his own house. He came back from World War II and they found this lot in Old Town, Maine. And it had four posts in the ground where somebody had started to put in a, in a house and they decided that they, they couldn't, and then so my grandfather bought that piece of land, and they built a platform on that, and then they built a house from that. Their first winter in Maine um, was a plastic shack, like just plastic, and my father was born, and they had a faucet coming out of the floor and dripping into a, um, into a, bu into a little bucket on the floor, and that was all that they had that first winter that my, my father was one years old. Um, and if you were to try to do that today, anywhere that isn't Grafton, um, they wouldn't let you. Like, if you, if you want to build a house that way, if you, if you can't afford to live anywhere, and yet you have the time to build something, you're not allowed to do it. And so we found a place, we found Grafton, that doesn't have any building code. Enforcement, building code enforcement, let me say that. Um, it's covered by the, the New Hampshire State um, building code, but there's no building code enforcement. There's no building inspectors in Grafton. There's no zoning. There's no homeowners association. There's no, um, there's just not a lot of anything. I mean, there's, there's to, to build this house, we didn't use a bank. We didn't use a mortgage. We didn't have a construction loan. We didn't use an architect. We didn't have no certificate of occupancy. We were able to move into the house whenever we felt like it, when we felt comfortable. Uh, we didn't use a general contractor. Um, None of the town and employees were involved in this in this project. Um, we did have to build, fill out a building notification form. Um, they just want to know, yes, you're building something. They want to come back and tax it. And so we paid $25. I drew a square on a piece of paper and said, this is where the driveway is. And that was it. Uh, we've never had anybody from the town come out since then, uh, ever, actually. Um, <coughs> we also, um, we've built this house without a truck, like I have a Subaru, and a trailer. Um, so I go to Home Depot and load up the, the roof rack of my car, and they're like, don't you have a truck? I'm like, no. And they're like, well, you shouldn't be doing this. And I'm like, you can have your opinion, but you know, I am doing this. And um, <clears throat> we've also done this without a porta potty um, or a dumpster. 
Um, and surprisingly enough, we haven't actually used any nails yet. Um, we, we're, the house is enclosed. We haven't used any nails yet. Um, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. We also haven't used any subsidies, incentives, tax credits, or re rebates, because it's just not something that um, we're willing to do. So where we are in Grafton, um, we're actually nine and a half miles from the Appalachian Trail. I just found this out last week. I didn't, had no idea. Um, Grafton's home to the Freetown Project. Um, some people will say the defunct Freetown Project. Um, but uh, that was a an effort to get people to not only locate to New Hampshire, but locate in one small town. Um, Grafton has a population of 1,300, 1,400 people, at least people that fill out the census. Um, so that could be a lot larger than that. Um, and it's also very close to Dartmouth College and Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. So um, my wife, Lori, actually works at Dartmouth College. Um, and uses the free bus service that runs between Canaan, which is the next town over, and directly right to the door of her office. Um, it doesn't cost us anything. The hospital and the college and other hypertherm large uh, companies um, pay for that service. And so um, she's able to ride it for free. And it saves us $200 a month in gas just um, by using the bus. Um, Grafton has a northern rail trail. Um, which runs from allegedly Grafton to White River Junction. It's about 26 miles long. Um, we have a friend who came to visit from New Jersey one weekend, and he actually walked to Lebanon and back in one day, which I think you know, walking 40 miles in one day is a bit much, but um, he did that. Um, Mount Cardigan State Park is in the northeastern corner of town. Um, and. About 50 feet off from the back corner of our property is actually the snowmobile um, corridor, New Hampshire corridor trails five and route five and route two. So if you're interested in snowmobiling, Grafton's a great place to be. Um, it's about 20 miles from either Plymouth or Lebanon. Um, it's so there's a Walmart in either direction, but there's actually nothing in Grafton itself, which is what we wanted. Um, Grafton is home to Burning Porcupine, which happens every year just after Porkfest. And um, John Connell has taken it upon himself to start the Peaceful Assembly Church. He bought the church in the center of um, Grafton Center and, um, and has started his own church. So when we were looking at Grafton, um, we, found we were looking for certain things. We were looking to ideally have, well, Critically, we really had to have DSL. We didn't have any option. Like that's that's a critical. We have to have high-speed internet access. Ideally, we would have cell reception. Grafton is known for not having cell reception. It's right in the middle of the valley, and so there's not a lot of cell reception in the center of town. But we found the one place in town where you can get cell reception, both on AT&T and Verizon. Um, we are in the closest corner of town to the rest of civilization, and so it's very convenient for us to get to um, the rest of you know, get to the grocery stores and stuff. Um, we actually live at the top of a hill, and we were looking to orient the house in a southerly orientation so we could take advantage of passive solar and things like that. Um, and because we wanted to do passive solar, we wanted to have nothing to the south, and so ideally the driveway would be to the south of the house. So we ended up driving down a road one day, and we saw this piece of land. Um, this is what we started with, and so, um, there's nothing there, it's just forest. And that was what we wanted. Um, we ended up cutting down a couple trees to put in a driveway. And so this is looking back up towards the road. And we brought in um, a couple free staters um, with an excavator to excavate the, um, the basement for the house. So this was forest. They pulled the, the way that they ideally would knock down a tree is rather than cutting off the tree and then hauling the tree away, you just push the tree over with the excavator. Um, it makes it a lot easier to get the root ball out so that way you can, you can move the tree away. Um, so we put in a driveway and in order to, uh, I had, I've never built a house. I've, I'm not a builder, I'm a web developer. So um, I think I can do it and so I did. Um, and so one of the, one of the things that we realize as we go through this process is how important level is. Um, 
it, unless you've ever built a house, you don't really appreciate how important, like, how, if things are not level, if you drop a bag of marbles, I don't know why you always drop marbles, but marbles will fly everywhere. Um, and so what, uh, what Neil is doing here is he is um, using a, uh, a Philly pole to, to determine whether or not they've dug deep enough. Um, at the time, I didn't have a very good compass, and so we had to figure out what was true north versus magnetic north, and we did our best. Um, it actually ends up being about 15 degrees facing east off of true south. So ideally, we'd get right at true south, but we're, we're off just slightly. Um, so after we dug down as far as we could, we put down a lot of crushed rock. Um, drainage is very important. Um, one of the books that I brought <coughs> this book Homing Instinct if you're interested in building your own house highly important I actually end up buying two copies one for myself one for my wife um, and they talk about in, in very realistic very straightforward language um, the the things that you should consider um, when you're thinking about building a house um, a lot of people, and us included, we looked through a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, you know, home magazines and stuff like that. Oh, I really like those shelves. I want to have that color in our bedroom. And then, wouldn't it be great if we had, you know, our toilet was so close to the bed or something? You know, there's so many things that you can think about. Like, I would much prefer to have all those things that you, that you could possibly think about to put into a house. Um, and one of the, the quotes that I really like from this book um, is that as he, the guy who wrote this book actually teaches a, a school for um, people who are interested in, in owner building their own house, designing and, own, and building. Um, and it's, it's a place up in Vermont. And he was teaching his class to a, um, one woman. And she, she's like, I'm just so overwhelmed. There's so many things. I don't know how big this room should be. I don't know how tall the room. The, I don't care about all that. I can't care about all that. And, and he says that's a very important point. What you do and don't care about is exactly what we're talking about. No one finds everything equally important. Some things will be less critical in your design and some more. None of it, however, is optional. If you think the height of the electrical outlets above the floor is unimportant, they will simply be designed by default. The electrician will be your architect here. Similarly, maybe you haven't given any thought to the relationship your house will have with the road, the neighbors, the sun, the wind, Mecca, whatever it is. It doesn't mean that these considerations, it doesn't eliminate these considerations from the design. It means that the foundation contractor will be your architect here. And don't worry, he'll probably consult with a backhoe operator. But just because you don't give a hoot about the orientation of your home with respect to the North Star, that doesn't mean it won't have one. And if you don't consider it, someone else will, and it will be designed by default. Um, I think that is incredibly important. Um, the, the things that we do every day. We, we are going to get up and we're going to make decisions. Um, and so if you could design your life from scratch, what would that life look like? Um, so here's, a, here's a, a thing that I thought was just brilliant. Each weekday morning, my process is this. I wake up, walk up the stairs, sit down to the computer, and figure out what is happening on the planet. Once I'm comfortable the sky is not falling, I walk to the kitchen, grind my coffee beans, and begin to boil water. While the water is heating up, I return to the computer and follow up on whatever tidbits tickled my fancy from the first pass. This morning, it was some World Cup research, followed by looking into options around wireless headphones. Turn out, turns out Sony sucks. Go figure. Water is boiling. Back to the kitchen, where I pour a hot cup of hot water into my French press and dig up my favorite ceramic cup. The coffee needs to sit for three minutes, which means back to the computer. Okay, why do Sony headphones suck? Poor sound quality, bad design, bit of both, really. Coffee's ready, so one more trip to the kitchen where I pour the steaming brew into my favorite cup and travel once more to my cave. Now, I want that. I want all of those decisions, my favorite ceramic cup, the French press, the grinding my own beans. Those are things that we get to decide. So if you get to decide how you live your life, what, what, what do you, how do you decide to live your life? So for us, we felt it was very important for us to build our own house because there wasn't anything that was out there that was adequate enough. If, if, if there was, we would have used that ourselves. We would have bought, we wouldn't have gone through this entire process and built our own house. Um, so that was a divergence. Um, so 
what we ended up doing is we put up, um, put down about a foot of crushed rock underneath the, underneath the basement, and then put in the the footers around the perimeter. So they're about two foot wide footers, um, so that we could build the the walls on top of them. Um, and then the process at that point was to start stacking styrofoam. So this is, this is one of those styrofoam panels, um, and I'll build one, I mean. So we have some styrofoam panels, and we have these little, these ones happens to be blue, but the ones that you'll see in the pictures are red or, or brown. These ones are kind of short. The ones in the pictures are actually about six inches longer. So it ends up looking something like this. And so the blue ties hold the wall from spreading when you fill concrete in, when you put concrete in the middle here. You end up tying rebar along in here. And then you just keep going up. So believe it or not, um, something that's made out of something like this will actually contain concrete long enough for it to solidify, and then the concrete is what holds up your house. Um, so I don't know how many panels we used, um, and I have another example. So this is these. This uses the two and a quarter inch styrofoam panels um, with the very very small ties. This is actually a section of our house. Um, so this is concrete, it's very heavy. Um, it's got rebar in here, rebar going horizontally every foot, vertically every foot, concrete in the middle, two, inch, two and a quarter inches of styrofoam on the inside, and eight and a quarter inches of styrofoam on the outside. So it ends up being an actual R45 rated wall. Um, <laughs> Most houses built today are insulated to maybe an R22, and if you're familiar with farmhouses in New England, um, they tend to be drafty. Um, in our case, it's concrete. There's not going to be any air going through those walls. Um, so the goals of the house, like you're going to build a house, and how long is this house going to last? And there's actually a number in mind when the general contractor comes along and says, we're going to build you a house. Sometimes it's 25 years. For me, that's not long enough. Um, styrofoam doesn't degrade. It doesn't break down. It doesn't rot. Um, it, it's earthquake proof. I mean, it's concrete. Um, we, we put double the amount of rebar in the walls, which helps reinforce the concrete. Um, and the reason being is that when, um, when I asked how much it would be to, to buy the rebar, um, they said it's going to be about $700. And I asked how much it would cost to value engineer to put only the amount of rebar that we would need to have into the walls, and they said about $1,500. And I'm like, well, I'll just put in double the amount of rebar, because the rebar is half the cost of hiring the engineer. So. Um, not only is it earthquake proof, it's insect proof. It doesn't have any food sources for termites. Not that termites are an issue around here. Um, it's vermin proof. There's no rodents that are going to chew through concrete. Um, it's actually fireproof. Um, these panels here will melt if you hold a flame to them, but they won't catch fire until the ambient temperature around them is about 800 degrees. Um, whereas a house, like a 2x4 built house, will catch fire around 450 degrees. So if 
if you have 800 degrees of temperature around your house, you've got other problems than, um, you know, like you're not in that house anymore. Um, the concrete itself won't actually burn. Um, they say it's a one to two hour firewall, but I'm not sure what will happen. Maybe the concrete will become brittle or something. Um, it's tornado proof. I mean, it's concrete. The house weighs 150 tons. Um, so there's not going to be any Auntie M kind of like issues with the house flying away. Um, it's actually very soundproof. Um, if you're familiar with that, STC ratings, it gets like a, a rating of like 55 to 60 STC, whatever that means. Um, but you can't hear anything on the inside of the house. Like we hear the snow plow go by because they're just dragging that blade along the ground. And we hear the, s the school bus go by, but we don't hear anything else. We don't hear wind. We don't hear anything. Um, like I could run the chainsaw out front and you're not going to hear it inside the house. And I actually have, the sleeping baby. Um, it's flood proof and we actually know that because we've been living in this house since December of 2010. Um, this is the first winter that we've had a roof. So living in New Hampshire without a roof is kind of a tricky thing because um, snow and rain will come down even if you're not prepared for it. Um, <laughs> And I have pictures of that. So flood proof, waterproof, it's actually bulletproof. Um, I don't, I'm not saying that to test anyone or have anybody try it. Um, I just wanna make that clear. I've been told six inches of concrete will stop handguns and rifles. Now uh, you can interpret that whatever you want, I'm not a gun guy. Um, but if you look up UL standard 752, um, they do have levels for bulletproofedness. Um, and there are companies that will test a one foot by one foot thick piece of whatever material you have, and they go from level one, which is like 22 rifles, to 50 caliber Browning MG, whatever, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I've been told that eight inches of concrete, which is what we have in the basement, will stop 50 caliber bullets, and six inches of concrete will stop almost everything else that's not a 50 caliber bullet. But if there's 50 caliber bullets coming through the walls, we're not in the house anymore either. So it's not, a, it's not something that I'm actually thinking about or worried about, but you know, there are people that are survivalists or zombie something something. Um, might be interesting. Um, it doesn't rot and it is UV resistant. So, so far that white foam that you see there is still exposed to the sun. We haven't put any house wrap on it or any siding. Um, it does dust up a little bit if you put your fingers on it, kind of like you would think would happen if it was a, a styrofoam cup in the woods. Um, it's really just styrofoam, so it acts like styrofoam does. Um, so after we stacked up, each one of these panels here is about a foot tall. After we stacked up um, 11 feet, we, um, we, we did a concrete pour. Um, and I should probably mention at this point that we bought forests, so we didn't have a house to live in. Uh, we didn't rent an apartment. We lived in that school bus um, that was gifted to us by another guy who was dating my mother-in-law at the time, and he said, don't, don't, don't bother fixing up the camper that you were planning on living in. I've got a bus, you can have it, just take it. My brother's using it for storage, it kills me, I want somebody to use it. And so we were living in that school bus, and that's me in addition to all the other stuff that we were doing, that was me fixing the brake lines for that bus so we could move it over to the land. So um, you can see in this picture there's um, those tall, I don't know what they're called, they're called strongbacks, but they're, they're bracing to hold the, the wall plumb while the concrete is, is curing. Um, one of the really great things about our, um, our land is our next door neighbors. Um, this is Ken, he's 80 years old. He saw a squirrel climb up a tree and run over and jump onto his roof and that made him mad enough to back up a four-wheeler to, uh, to that tree, put an extension ladder on it, climb up the tree with a sawzall, an electric sawzall with an extension cord so he could cut off that branch. 80 years old. Um, and he's fantastic. Um, him and his wife this is like one of the best things about living in Grafton is having people like this. Um, our other neighbors across the street while we were drilling our well, they ended up, um, they came over with some pound cake and some lemonade in the middle of summer. They're, they're just fantastic. 
So a lot of stacking, a lot of putting in rebar. Um, you can kind of see the drainage system that we have there with all the crushed rock all the way around it. Um, and we asked a lot of questions because we've never done this before. And so in this, in this picture, we're actually asking Lauren like what she would do and you know, ask a lot of questions because you never know what you might, uh, who might have the right answer. So after we poured um, the, the first pour of concrete, um, we then put on a floor. And unfortunately, a huge chunk of my photos got deleted accidentally. So there's a big, huge jump here. But we had this little gang plank that, my, that terrified my father. Um, and we put in our front door. And we had to block out the windows and, and the patio door on the, base, on the south side. So the side that the ramp is on is the south side. And you can tell from this picture that um, winter's coming. I mean, the, the leaves are turning orange. So then we kind of gave up. We, we put a big tarp over the top of it, and we moved into the basement. Um, and water comes down anyway. So what we did was we basically tacked up plastic around the outside edges of each quadrant of the house, and water would come into those pieces of plastic and get very pregnant. And then you poked a hole into it and then drain it into a trash can. So at the point that, um, at the point that our son was born, um, I was getting up every hour to drag trash cans outside. And Lori was getting up every hour to feed him. So she came up with this idea for this water slide system to direct the water into a bucket in the center of the house. And whenever the sump pump detected that it was full, it would pump it outside. So it was now automated, made life so much easier. Part of the reason why is because when I would go upstairs to drag the trash cans outside, um, I, had, I had to go outside because there were no stairs. Um, so I was running outside in the middle of January to drag trash cans outside once every hour in the middle of the night or whatever, whether if it was raining. Um, so <laughs> stairs became a very high um, important thing. Um, so then spring happened, and we decided to take the tarp off. And I can tell you from experience that the tarps are not worth anything, so don't even bother. We didn't even do it the second year. Um, we took the tarp off and started putting in stairs. But we always had the stair hole that we had to deal with. Like we had floor everywhere else. But the stairs, any water that would come in would come in and go down the stairs. And then we were living in the basement. Um, so we had to put a little pop-up tent over it. and cover that with a tarp. So that's what our house looked like for that first, spr that f the spring after we first started. Um, but the basement was pretty nice. Like we, we have a nice little kitchen and workspace. Um, but you can see on the side over there, there's, a, um, there's some yellow plastic. And the water would kind of cry down the walls. And so we would have to direct that water rather than let it go onto the floor. We'd direct it into buckets. And so we would dump that out. Um, but what's not shown here is that we do have a dishwasher, a, a sink, a toilet, a tub, our bed. Um, and so then we started building again, using what we learned the, the previous time. And so this time, we actually extended the rebar up to, um, it was actually waving in the air most of the time, this 10 foot tall piece of rebar that was always just kind of hanging out. But the really nice thing about where we are is that there are a lot of free staters in Grafton. And whenever we would need to move one of these very large beams, we would put, a, put the word out on, free, on uh, f Facebook and say, we're offering pizza for free. And all you have to do is just help us put this beam into place really quick. Um, and so imagine one of these. This is, uh, this is one of those beams. Um, this is actually made up of 36 plies of plywood. Um, instead of an 18 inches tall, 5 and a quarter inches thick. So instead of 5 and a quarter inches long, imagine one of these that's 41 feet long. Um, it's very heavy. Um, but we would always have a dozen people show up for pizza, um, which was very nice. And we would have to make sure that it was set into place, in the right place. So Lori would guide one end, and I'd guide the other end. And um, we had some help one day, and, and I thought it was the, the, the funniest thing. And she said, not Lori, one of our uh, Free Stater friends, she's like, 
everything builds on everything else. It's like everything, every, it was just this epiphany. She's like, everything, you needed to do this first because then you would have something to set this on and then you would have, and I, I thought that was very cute. Um, so this is actually held in place by a two by six temporarily until the concrete is poured and then it encases the end of the concrete. Um, so this is actually held in place just by one piece of wood and just hanging out in the styrofoam. I had my mother, um, because I'm afraid of heights, I had my mother go out onto the edges of the thing and styrofoam around the, the, uh, the windows. Um, so, yeah. One of the, the more difficult things was getting material up to the right height, um, up to the right level. And so at one point we had a crane come and deliver the material and place it up on the second floor because this is, this is now the second floor. Um, floor. So you can kind of see how the, the bracing in place and the styrofoam getting stacked up. Um, we had to move all this material up from the, the driveway up to the, the work area. Um, and we had to keep the stairway covered because otherwise rain would come down. Um, and since we are living in the house, the cat's in the house and he's running around. So this is what it looks like looking down into the wall. So you can see the red ties that hold the wall together, the rebar that's going horizontally every foot, and then there's one over here that's going vertically. Um, so the whole wall empty together. And every row was another success, so I would take a lot of pictures like that. Um, so I'm afraid of heights, um, and that beam in the middle is just sitting there. It's just sitting on those, those red posts, those lally columns. Um, and we, we had the bracing, and, the, and we built a catwalk to walk around the top side of it. So we could walk around about eight feet above the floor. Um, and while I was doing this, I was home by myself most of the time. Um, what you can't see, what you can kind of see, is um, down in the bottom right corner is a playpen. That's where Alex was sitting. Um, so he would play while I was building. Um, so I would be up eight feet above the floor. And if he had an issue, I would climb down. Um, so we, we kind of made it work. One of the things that um, we realized is very important is to have a laser level, and that's on that tripod thing in the bottom center. Um, we didn't have to buy one. The excavator guys let us rent there, uh, borrow theirs. Um, you need to have a chop saw or a, a, um, a miter saw. That's a very important thing. And then you need these, and that's it. Um, like, there's not a lot of other tools that we use. Um, we didn't use any nails, so we didn't need a nail gun. We used just this, this screw gun. Um, for the longest time, we had just one screw gun. So one of the things that's um, kind of tricky is when you place a floor on a styrofoam object like this, you need to attach the floor to the styrofoam. And so in, in this picture, you can see the, um, those octagonal panels that are up there. They're actually um, octagonal on the front, and then they have these two tabs that kind of go through the styrofoam, and then they hang out and wait for the concrete to come in. And once the concrete is surrounding them, they're, they're bound in place. And then you attach the floor, you attach the rim joists to those plates. Um, so I always had to keep him entertained. Um, so most of the time, it was me. When we were doing floors, Jack was there. And when we did the roof, we had a lot of people help. Um, but he loves those little ties. Um, so this is this. I would have shown the um, the model of the house if I was on my own computer. But um, we didn't use an architect. We designed it ourselves. And we designed it using Google Google SketchUp, uh, which is a free program. And we ended up getting some socks from them um, that says it doesn't stink. Um, I'm not sure what, why that's their thing, but um, we drew the entire, s the entire house in SketchUp and built from that. Um, the only part that was engineered was the floors by the lumber yard um, because I said I want to be able to support an inch and a half to two inches of concrete on this floor. And he's like, okay, I can do that. Um, so I know that the floors will hold up the, the concrete that we put on them. And I've actually been told we could park a, a fire truck on them. So. Again, I'm not going to try that, 
Um, but so we had a concrete pour day um, and filled the wall full of concrete with one of these um, concrete pump trucks. Um, each, one, each time one of these guys comes out, it's like $750. So you do it like in one big batch. Um, but we were getting from where we started to this point here is 32 feet. And so I asked the, the pump guy, I said, how, you know, we're, we're planning on going up to 45 feet. Um, can you, can you, can your pumps go that high? And he said, as long as it's less than 120 feet, it, we can do it. So we could have kept going. Um, and for a while I was considering building a, an extra floor um, because why not? Like, I mean, if we had the money, we would have, but we didn't need to approve it with an architect. We didn't need to approve it with the town. We didn't need to ask anybody's permission. We didn't need to work with the bank. We're, we're just doing this the way that we want to do it. Um, and when you fill the walls with, full of concrete, they end up crying the concrete through these little, little slits in here. Um, only on the inside, because the inside was two and a quarter inches, but the outside was, had enough, um, enough styrofoam that it wouldn't make it all the way through the outside. Then we would have another day where we would call all of our friends and ask them to help us put up the rim joists so that we could attach the floor to the walls. So the center beam that, that we had put up in the other picture, um, we, that the floor sits on top of that and then it attaches to the sides on this, this rim joist. Um, and it's not easy to get up 10 feet above the floor. Um, so like this is, it, it makes it look easy because we have something to stand on, but we're always like moving scaffolding around and, and we don't have any lifts or anything. Um, most of the time we were just using those two ladders. Um, and so, yeah, again, fall is coming. And so we had to put another floor on. And each one of those um, floor joists is 34 feet long. I would take one end and Jack Schimmick would take the other end. Jack runs Alt Expo downstairs. Um, so we hired Jack to help us put in all the floors. So we hired him first floor, second floor, third floor, and the rafters. Um, and I would take a level on one end and he would take a level on the other end. And we would basically push it out the window, heave it over that center beam using a big giant fork. And then he would push it, um, and then we would have to use a level and say, are you happy, are you happy? And once it was happy, then we would screw it to the wall. So every single one of those, um, there's 26 of them on every floor, so times three. It was, it was a big project. Um, there were times when we actually had to lift the beams out of place and shave some underneath it because there was, a, there was a, some sort of def some uh, deformed part of that center beam. Um, we also had to move all these, these flooring panels for the next floor up, um, up from the, the driveway. So um, for part of that summer, um, Nick Ford actually lived on the bus since we weren't living there. Um, he lived on the bus while we lived in the basement and he, he in exchange offered an hour of labor a day. So a lot of the rebar ended up being moved around and flooring panels and almost anything else that needed to be moved. Um, so it was very helpful to have somebody available to, to help out like that. Um, Jack's not a fan of heights either. Um, but every floor panel was glued down and screwed down into the, glu into the, the, fl into the, uh, the joists. Um, and we had to get the, the rebar up for the next floor up um, for, the, for the gable ends, and we didn't have any um, stairs. And so like, this looks deceptively simple, but moving that much steel from a driveway up to the third floor is a lot of work. Um, I have this idea since I grew up in Maine um, that, so I grew up in Maine, we moved to California, and then we moved back, but we didn't go all the way back. Um, since I grew up in Maine and having to deal with a lot of firewood all the time, I had this idea that we would build these crates um, and take one of these crates, hook it up, in, put it into a, a um, put it into a, so that's Alex. Say hi, Alex. <laughs> 
So um, you take a, take a tractor with some forks and take one of these empty crates out into the woods, fill it up with wood, cut it, split it, stack it, and then never have to move and throw and stack it ever again. So that's the plan. We don't own a tractor that has forks on it, but I've built all the crates. And so we use the crates to store the wood and the, and the double door there is big enough so that we can set the crates just inside the door and move it around inside with the pallet jack. One of the nice things that we like about our, our location in Grafton is that a mile away is a, is a dairy. Uh, they participate in the Cabot um, Cooperative. And um, if you get there before the milk truck gets there, you can buy raw milk for $4 a gallon, um, which I guess is a lot cheaper than raw milk elsewhere in the state. Um, so we're able to just drive down the street and, and get milk straight off the cow, basically. Um, I designed and built all of the stairs um, in SketchUp, having never done it before, just trying to figure out how things get assembled. Um, and like most things in the house, they're overbuilt. Um, these are also glued and screwed together. One of my unofficial goals for the house is to be able to walk around and pad around on the floor without any noise. So having concrete floors and everything is glued and screwed together, nothing's going to come apart. Um, so winter, uh, almost winter time, it's time to, to chop some firewood. And that's what the crates look like inside the house. Um, so we've. We're, we're kind of do-it-yourselfers. I don't know if you've picked up on that yet or not. Um, <laughs> when, when Lori and I got married, um, we ended up, we, we didn't, I don't know why. Um, we wanted to have Thanksgiving dinner for our reception, and we didn't want to cut anybody from the guest list. And so we ended up inviting 200 people and self-catering a Thanksgiving dinner for our own wedding. I didn't sleep the night before. I was putting turkeys in and out of ovens. Um, but yeah, we're, we're kind of ambitious, and so far it's worked out. Um, I hope that it keeps working out. But um, yeah, so the firewood thing, um, we're, we're not, other than this, which is actually made out of a petroleum product, as I understand it, um, we're, not, you, we're not going to use any petroleum or fossil fuels going forward. Like, I know that there's an investment in time and money at the beginning, and so we're going to use whatever materials we have right now. and make use of them, um, but in the, uh, in the ongoing long term, we don't want to use any fossil fuels at all. Um, we don't want to use propane or number two oil or ideally we, don't, we wouldn't use gasoline, we'd use electricity um, and electricity that we would generate ourselves. Um, so the firewood is, it comes from our property. That's actually the firewood that was in the driveway. So for a couple of years, we're going to have firewood that we just cut down anyway, just put in the driveway. Um, we live on a dirt road, um, so a lot of people who, s who hear the idea of reduced government, the first thing, for some reason, the thing that they think about is what about the roads? And in our case, I'd go out there with a shovel and fix it. Um, if the government didn't take care of it, I would. Um, I know that not everybody lives on a dirt road, but um, it's actually a very nice dirt road. Um, so this is, this is the day before Halloween. Um, so we ended up stopping at this point. Like we were planning on keeping to, keeping working until November. Um, like, and at this point, Nick was still living on the bus. So we said, Nick, you need to you need to get off the bus. You need to go live someplace else because we don't want to pick you know bodies out of the snowbank in the springtime. Um, so yeah, we ended up getting six inches of snow on the day before Halloween. Um, and you can tell from here, um, there's no tarp over the top. Some of the windows e aren't even covered. And in this case, you can actually see all the way through the house. So not only do we not have a roof, but like the wind is whistling through. And so um, on top of the bus were this set of batteries, which I didn't want to have destroyed by the winter. So I went up there and, and brought them inside. Um, this is actually the winter solstice here. Um, and so you can see when the sun is as low in the sky as possible, um, how far in, this is actually at solar noon, how far in that sun actually comes. So in those four windows on the second floor and the four, same four windows on the first floor, we're planning on um, growing what is known as window farms in some, some people's um, description. So um, 
I'd like to grow tomatoes, strawberries. I mean, with with walls that are this thick, we have they're they're 16 and a half inches thick, so we have some very deep sills that we can grow all sorts of things in. Um, we're not doing that yet. Um, we don't have windows yet. Um, but I went up to the top floor, and so you saw the snow on Halloween. This is the winter solstice. This is December 21, and the snow is gone. Um, it's frozen, and in no other place in New Hampshire could you have a chimney going through a tarp and start the start the wood stove. I mean, we're we're. I didn't want to do anything that was dangerous, but in my mind, this isn't that dangerous. Um, so. It's, it's kind of a very sharp knife in Grafton. Like, you can hurt yourself because um, the government isn't there to protect you. But, um, yeah, so we have a very nice um, exposure to the sun in even the, the darkest days of winter. Um, so in the springtime, so in, in about three weeks from now, a year ago, um, we decided to take the panels, the, the wooden panels, off the windows, the big, um, the big cover over the patio door in the south, and start working again. And so we put plastic down on the floor in preparation for putting concrete all over this floor. Um, you can see the water management system in its almost final form. Um, this big PVC pipe coming down and, and draining into the bucket in the center actually failed um, on the most convenient day possible, the day that Lori's dad came and visited us. Um, so he saw that entire thing f collapse and fail, and I was up there holding that funnel with my arm, trying to direct the water into that tube um, with the water running down my side and the basement flooding and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, but yeah, so we ended up putting down radiant tubing. Um, because I've always wanted to live in a house that has radiant tubing, um, radiant floors. I've, I've never lived in a house that has radiant floors. I've felt what it feels like in other people's houses, but I said, if I'm going to build my own house, I'm going to have radiant floors. And there are multiple ways of doing this. You can do it so that there are grooves in the flooring and then with um, like aluminum channels to kind of direct the heat up. Um, the benefit of having concrete, um, about an inch and a half or two inches of concrete on the floor is that it holds the heat. It's a big thermal mass. So not only do we have the thermal mass from the, um, the, the walls, um, which kind of acts as a thermal flywheel, but we also have the thermal mass of the floors. Um, and so the goal is to be able to heat this house with very little energy at all. Um, ideally, we would get most of, the sun, most of the heat from the sun using solar hot water evacuated tubes, um, and then supplement as needed with a wood boiler or just the wood stove. Um, we don't own a wood boiler yet, but um, we're going to be um, you know, running warm water through those. Um, we had to buy our own meter panel. Um, I had never bought one of these before. Um, and so um, we, we bought the land in June, and then we actually got electricity in September. So for the first four months, we were working without a solid source of electricity. Um, Springtime, we start building up the walls, firewood. Um, so you can see there that those panels are square. I had to stack them up and then take them down, mark them, and then take them down and cut them. Um, at this time, we decided that we didn't need the bus anymore, and we found another free stater who wanted to take ownership of the bus. And so he took it and moved it to his land. So now he's going to use it to live and build. Um, stacking up the walls came up with this idea because, I mean, pouring concrete into a triangle is kind of tricky. Um, so we um, kind of had a way to get, had to have a way to get concrete into the wall, which is this holes, and then a way to cap them off. Um, and I also wanted to have a, a long overhang. And so I came up with this probably stupid idea of having these boards going all the way through and in, encasing them in concrete as we poured. Um, we decided at this point to empty out half of the basement and paint the floor because we were tired of having all the concrete dust up all the time. Um, there were times when I used the chainsaw to carve the house out of styrofoam. Um, and at this point I got kind of tired and so we hired Jack to come back to help us stack up the gable ends. So you can kind of see here the, the line and the marks that we had to take down the foam, cut it and then put it back up. 
Lori came up with this idea of draining the third floor so we embedded tubes, these scuppers, into the corners of the floor. And so if the floor got too full of water, like more than an inch and a half, the, the water would drain out of the floor. Looking into the wall, this is just before the concrete pour. Adam's actually here cutting off some, uh, some bolts for us. Um, and so this is the very peak of the house. So keep, keep in mind what that little circle there at the top looks like. Um, so we had to fill that full of concrete and at that, at that very, well, I'll talk about that in a second. We could have done this kind of roofing um, with, with trusses. Um, we didn't want to do that. We wanted to have that space be livable. And so um, we decided not to do that. Now, during this entire time, we always had water kind of just sitting on this floor. And so um, we had, th this floor stood up for two winters worth of abuse. And so if anybody's in thinking about building a house, Advantec and the Boise Cascade, Joyce will, you can sit them in water for years and they won't come apart. They're not like regular OSB panels. Um, just before the pour, we decided to put in posts for a, a deck, and I dropped something into it. Um, and because we didn't have to move the concrete around when we had a pump there, we decided to pump the floor and the wall, the gable ends at the same time, which was probably very ambitious and kind of dumb. Um, but Lori, so this is the concrete hose coming off the concrete pump. She was giving hand signals to the concrete pumper. Um, and so that hose had to go all the way up at that peak of that house. And they stuck it into the top and turned it on and it exploded. It came out of the top of the house and covered Lori, covered Jack, covered me, concrete all over the floor. Lori was actually in shock and has a, a chemical burn um, in the place where the, the hose was right by her. And um, it was a mess. I had to take like a, a cubic yard of concrete off the floor. Um, so now final, um, final floor, we had to hire another crane to put that beam that I already showed you in place because there's no way we could get that up there. Um, finally washing the wall, marking out where the walls are going to be. This says exterior type adhesive, you want that kind if there's an option. Putting up rafters, I was too afraid to get up there to do this and so we ended up putting 3,500 screws in just the rafters alone um, and with a screw pound, it's kind of tedious. Um, this is not OSHA approved, using a collapsible folding ladder with a brace and then putting a plank on it and then sitting on it. Um, but we had this tent over the stairs for the longest time because we had no roof. We didn't want the water to come down the stairs. And so, we hired some really great guys to do things that I would not do myself. Um, like that is 25 feet off the ground. I, I won't do that. Um, we put zip system panels on the roof, which are a waterproofing, waterproof panel. We taped all the seams. So this is that final peak. Um, we had to get all that material up there. Um, and yeah, so like all of putting down styrofoam, putting down roofing panels. Again, not OSHA approved. This was his safety harness, um, homemade. <laughs> we finally had enough of a roof on to take that off. And um, Jason Talley cutting off a bolt. Alex got to swing back and forth in that space. That's, that's eventually going to be my office. Um, built my own chimney, 48 feet tall. Um, we couldn't start the wood stove until that was through the roof, and each one of those blocks weighs 75 pounds, leveling every single one of them. Um, photos out of order. Um, Lori, pregnant, sitting, cutting rebar. So, so yeah, that's, that's kind of our thing. Um, a lot of people think government and community are the same things. Um, they're not. Um, you can only focus on so many things, and we choose to focus on the community part of it um, rather than the government part of it. Um, just simply because we don't have time to do everything and we've kind of been busy. Um, but I guess that's it. Is that it? That's it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that was, that was three years compressed into an hour. Um, if you have any questions, 
If you want to get a tour of Grafton, anytime you're in Grafton, come up, let me know. I'll give you the tour of town. Um, if you give me enough advance, I'll let you even, I'll even take you to places where people will talk to you because they'll know that you're coming.